Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. This is an interview I promised you folks a while ago with Dale Kingsmill, our YouTube neighbor. She was down here in LA for an event. It was nice enough to come down to the office. This is the first video we recorded on our new interview set, but because it was the first video we recorded there, even though we did some tests, the lighting isn't uh, 100%, but I think it's a great interview. The lighting will be even better next time. Thanks for bearing with us. Without further ado, Dale Kingsmill. Welcome to the show, everybody. My guest is a, a writer, uh, an actor, a, uh, a for Wolfgang, a director, a producer, probably technically, and also a YouTuber and a dungeon master. Dale Kingsmill joins us all the way from Australia. You came all the way out here for a whole big event happening in L.A., and we have sort of kidnapped you in order to yeah. ask you questions. Well, I mean, kidnapped me with me coming here myself. Correct, but, yes, yeah, yes. That's, that's the most fancy intro I've ever been given for anything. Really? Well, yeah. it won't be, it won't, I'm sure you have more fancy intros in your future. Mm. Uh, Wolfgang is the web series that you produced and acted in and along with your sister wrote and it was 40 some odd episodes, is that yeah, right? Yeah, I think it was 40 in the end, yeah. And it is wrapped up. It People is. can watch it. There'll be a link in the doobly-doo if you want to check it out. Now that it is wrapped up, it, would you say that that is, like, is that one of the things you're proudest of that you've done? I think I am. It's it's so bizarre because I don't think it's, you know, the most amazing web series ever made. It's not, like, a perfect product or anything, but it was something that I was just, like, I wanted to make a, a series for something. I was working on pitching it to um, ABC in Australia, okay. which is kind of the, I don't know, the free channel, I guess. Okay. That, that, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like there's no ads or anything like right. that. But it's like a good starting point for a lot of artists. So I kept trying to work towards pitching it to the ABC, but there were just so many hoops. And eventually I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to make it myself. And it'll be one camera and it'll be a little bit crappy. <laughs> and I'll just, uh, I'll hire my friends and I'll hire my sort of relatives and it'll be and you did hire them you paid them I you made did. sure that you paid out of pocket for everything yeah which <laughs> it ended up being most of the budget it was a very small budget right. and basically all of it went to paying my friends and then like a tiny bit went to wolf t-shirts that's that's it that's <laughs> the entire thing i guess food we paid for food and so how how what have you learned from coming out, now you're, it's finished, you've come out the other side of this process. What were your big takeaways? First of them was, I, because I'm an actor, I guess I had this like self-centered theory that directors were like people who come and talk to the actors and they like guide them in how to do stuff and whatever. But I, I learned that that is not what a director does. A director does a whole lot of stuff that has nothing to do with the actors and they have to like organize things ahead of time. They have to just constantly put out fires because it was it, like the plan was to film as we were going, like once a month or once every two months we would get together and we'd just film in little bits. And then one of my cast members moved out here to to California and I was like oh oh crap okay now we gotta we gotta get something together ahead of time so we filmed like five months in advance oh. before she left and then we planned uh for her to come back by oh it was it was by April or something like that and then another actor moved to a different it was moved to New Zealand and then it was all just like just constantly, okay, now I have to get everything written in two weeks time. And I mean, thank goodness my sister was writing it with me because right. I would not have been able to do it at all. There were a lot of sleepless nights and it was just kind of panic mode all the time and then lots of rest in between. And then it was panic mode again. It is uh, one camera and it's shot in what looks like to be either your living room or the living room of an apartment somewhere. <laughs> or the dining room, is it, was that, did you feel the constraints of, were you constantly like, I wish we had more cameras, I wish we had more lights, or was it working within those constraints fuels creativity? I mean, early on, I just really wished, because I, I had plans to go out and scout a location, right. but ended up just doing it in, we, we call it the casino. It's okay. the downstairs of my house is like all concrete walls and it has down lights and a bar. So my cousin walked in when we first moved there and said, oh, it's a casino. So that's, <laughs> that's what we call it. Um, so I'd hoped to go somewhere else. So for the whole first chunk when we were filming, I was super stressed out, just wishing that I had more equipment, whatever, but I may do, it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> was it uh, tricky directing your friends? 
Oh, it's so, I was really bad at it because because I spent the whole time being like, oh yeah, I mean, maybe if we should just try it a different way. I wish, I wish that I had decided at the beginning whether I was going to be a director or just let them do their own thing. Right. Because I ended up hovering kind of in the middle, which was really a tricky space to inhabit because. How many of them are or aspire to be professional actors? And how many of them were just your friends and you roped them in? Uh, both Natalie and Daniel, uh, aspiring actors, uh, and I met them during my theater degree. Right. Um, so they were great and wonderful. And then, uh, William, who came into the series later on, is played by my friend Jaden, who I just knew from high school, but he's a freak. Like the, the first time he ever acted, he just jumped into a uh, drama company, which was like the after school extracurricular theater stuff. And, and we just had a couple of weeks to learn a monologue for the Shakespeare Festival uh, in the Estedford, and he won. <laughs> he stopped, He just learned the Shylock monologue of all oh, nice. things. He dislocated his knee the day before, and he still went on stage and nailed it and won. And so he was- Do you remember what monologue you did? I do. I did um, Oh for a Muse of Fire. Oh, okay. Oh, well, for a Muse fifth. of Fire that yeah. would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. Can you still do it? I can do- Bits of it. A chunk of it, mostly so, the start. Having rapped on Wolfgang, are you thinking about doing another, doing something else, doing a second web series or? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I want to kind of try out maybe some short film stuff sure. with okay. friends. That would be cool. I definitely want to make more web series, but I also want to have more equipment the next time I do it. Because right. this time it was like, I want to do it and I want to do it now. What do I have and how can I make it work? But if I was to do it again, I'd want to like actually invest in more equipment and stuff. I, I can, I know that feeling. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's, they tell you that just shoot with whatever you've got, but it helps if the, what you got is nice. Yeah. It makes a difference. Uh, your theater, you have a degree in theater. I do. And uh, what you said you had a, uh, you took a, you actually took a board game class at one point related to your minor. Yeah, well, cause I'm a double degree in theater and English literature. Nice. Got Typical it, yeah, sure. Typical art yeah. student. Yeah. Um, and then partway through, I found out it, it was such a weird sequence of events because I was walking past um, a, a bunch of offices to get to my mum's office and just saw a door open and a ton of Doctor Who stuff inside. And I was like, oh, who's is that? That's really cool. And I mentioned it to mum and she said, oh, that'll be Chris. You'd like Chris. I'll, I'll introduce you. And so she introduced me to Chris. And then we were talking and he said that he was about to teach a board game class. Like, you could, There's a class on board games? Nice. And he said, yeah, designing board games. And I was like, that's amazing. So I got special permission to do that class, even though it was outside of my degree. And then I accidentally, it was like a third year class. And then I took another one. <laughs> and then I did a second year class that was sort of related to those two. And then I took another second year class and then I looked down and I realized I only had to take one more class. And it was like the intro one from first year. So I showed up with all these 18 year olds who were fresh out of high nice. school. And I was like, well, I know everything, so. So uh, why, how come, why not make board games? It seems like you spent all the time to figure it out. I mean, I would love to make board games. I, have you thought of, have you prototyped anything? Do you have any ideas? I do, I do lots of little bits of prototyping. I tend to get hyper fixated and then move on to the next thing, sure. which is so counterproductive. But there's like, I can't help it. I played recently the um, the Buffy board game with my okay. friends. And as we were sitting there, they would be like, oh man, I wish this was a little bit different. I was like. I think I can fix that. I think I can fix the movement mechanics. I think I can. That's where it starts, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I ended up taking photos of the rule book and then making notes as I was going home, just going, I, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to house you? rule this. Um, I'm halfway through. Fair enough. Actually, speaking of Buffy, like Buffy, like uh, Wolfgang sort of seems very, you know, if you took what we do in the shadows and matched it up with Buffy, were those inspirations? Absolutely. Were there, were there direct inspirations? I don't know whether they were direct inspiration. The, the biggest inspiration was, um, it was based on a stupid game my friends and I played when we were in preschool. Nice. Um, I was the leader of the werewolf gang because I was a very cool six-year-old. <laughs> um, and so it's just been a thing in the back of my head that I, I, I love werewolves. I don't know. I'm a dork. I'm a geek. This is what it's about. Um, and then as I grew up, I love Buffy. I love what we do in the shadows, being human, just all oh, these, sure. these little, especially the comedies that work with the supernatural, I really like. And so eventually I just kept thinking about this concept of, it was all based around, I, cause the game was, it's, it's real dumb. Just for the record, real okay, dumb. Let's hear it. There were no rules or anything. It was just well, we pretended to be werewolves who shared a house and there was a couch in the house. 
that Amadeus, was it. Because, yeah. That's the entire premise of the of the werewolf gang. And so that was the premise of the show. And I thought it'd be funny to have something where it was just the everyday lives of werewolves when they're not werewolves. I mean, we live in that era where no good idea goes unexplored. Yeah. So you have an idea and you're like, this is going to stick around until yeah. eventually exactly. someone invents YouTube. And then I can... <laughs> Finally. Yeah. Where when did Where did the spark to become an actor come from? When, when was... When was the first, was it a performance or a film that you oh, saw geez. that made you go, oh, I want to do that? Well, I mean, I started high school and um, and had drama classes there. And I liked it because I was just a precocious, like, annoying, cocky, like, I was that kid. And I could remember lines and that was nice. And then my family moved north. So I grew up in, like, a rural farming town. Uh, well, I'm not going to try to, um, you know, uh, pretend like that didn't happen. We had a little lighting. <laughs> we had a little lighting problem, uh, and now we're back. Uh, we were talking about you becoming an actor, being a precocious theater student in high school. So it was all the way into high school, and you had not known that you wanted to be an actor. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did. I did Tournament of the Minds, which I don't know if they have it here. They but might, but we don't call it that. What is it? It's Tom is like it's a competition kind of where you're given like usually a social issue or whatever. It's got a couple of categories. It's got maths and engineering. It's oh, so got... it's like uh, academic decathlon, I think. is Kind of, yeah. But um, you're given a problem and you have to solve it in the form of a play. Oh, wow. Kind of. And so, and you're Holy all moly. like kids, but you have to write the script yourself and make the costumes yourself. And you've wow. got like a four by four square meter zone in which you do stuff. And I, I sort of lucked my way into doing that when I was in primary school, like third grade and on to sixth grade. And like, we we won state one year. Nice, congratulations. Well, of course you did. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was this weird little thing where it wasn't really acting. It was honestly, everyone stands in a line. And then when it's your time to talk, you step forward and you say, oh. but I remember my first ever line. Really? My first ever line was, but son, being an artist is the worst occupation you can be. <laughs> I would agree with that. I think that's probably accurate. <laughs> Nice. Oh, it was good. It was That's, good stuff. I had a fake beard. It was. Mm. And what at that point was there any spark of like, oh, I like being on stage, or I, like... I liked the attention definitely. Okay, sure. I don't know whether I liked acting at the time. I was more into writing back then. But um, then when we moved north to Wollongong, because I grew up in sort of a rural farming town, uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of acting happening sure. necessarily. But then as we were moving north, Mum sort of said, we, "We've got to find a new high school for you." Do you want to go to Smiths Hill, which is the sort of academic high school where you have to take an exam to get in? And I was so against that idea. I was like, no, I refuse. They should just let people go to schools. But I was fine with the idea of auditioning for the performing arts high school. That was fine. I guess people who weren't performing arts could still go to that school. But yeah, so I, I was like, yeah, I'll do I'll do acting at the at the other school instead. And I auditioned and I got in and probably a year after starting there I went oh wait no I actually I actually like this and I actually want to like learn to be better at it rather than just coasting where I am I wanted to actually take on advice from the teachers which was very new to me and you did you went to you ultimately went to university and got a degree what was that experience like <sighs> what did you learn well <laughs> I actually hated my theater degree <laughs> I I feel like I Love my cohorts sure. from there. I made a lot of great friends. Yeah. But it's I was a big part really, of school is the friends you make. Yeah, and I, I was just super frustrated with the teaching because it was kind of a lot of uh, teachers from the 80s who could offer lots of valuable stuff, and I loved those bits and pieces, but most of the time they were kind of just pushing how they succeeded in acting in the uh, 80s. And so a lot of it was very avant-garde. They were very into oh. sort of shock value and whatever. And I was like, this isn't really what I'm interested in doing. And I, I decided to try and do it myself and become an entertainer myself. And I thought, I'll make a YouTube channel. It was out of spite. It was out of spite that them. I made that channel. And then it worked by accident. <laughs> uh, so did you, in, 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 when you were at university, did you have an idea of a career path? Did yeah. you have an idea of how am I going to translate this into either making a living or doing it full time? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I think I was still answering at the time. Lots of people would say, what do you want to do? And just so that they would stop asking questions, I would say, oh, I'll study the theater and then I'll get an education 
masters and I'll teach drama. Oh, really? And okay, I never was, wanted to do that. That was just an answer you gave people. But it was people. a great answer to give people. Because <laughs> it stopped them from asking. Yeah, they were like questions. a teacher. Yes, that's that's sensible. That's good. So did you see the experience of like uh, the ideal? Not the actual, not the reality. The reality might have been disappointing. But the ideal of going to university to get a theater degree as an end to itself, that was just going to be a great experience? Or did you see it as part of a process toward becoming a professional actor? Probably part of a process. I felt like straight out of high school, I'd learned a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't remotely think I knew enough to start actually jumping in and doing stuff. But So having done it now on YouTube, has that changed your perspective on the profession at all? I mean, it certainly changed my perspective on the path. Oh, you're <laughs> really? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's always been that same sort of setup of, you know, you, you have to do it in the right order. You have to sure. learn and then you have to, I mean, if you're Australian, you have to like be in so many plays and get so many reviews and then you move out to LA and then you start auditioning for things and then you pay your dues and you have to take all the classes and whatever. And I've, I'm just kind of coasting on the sidelines. Making does, my own stuff. Which you can do. Now we have the democratization of technology. Yeah, exactly. Anybody can do this stuff. Uh, you have a platform. You have people that watch. But does has moving to L.A. always seemed inevitable to you? It didn't. Okay. Until I made really good friends out here. Ah, I see. <laughs> which is a mistake. Terrible mistake. Never do it. Because now it's like no matter where I live, I'm going to miss people. Oh, sure. Yeah. Which yeah. sucks. But yeah, I don't know. Now it suddenly seems like that's going to have to happen. Really? It's like it's it's the next step. It's the next phase. If I want to keep growing, if I want to keep doing stuff, this is this is where it happens. Are there actors that you see and you think I would like to have their career? Like they inspire you or they motivate Ooh. you? Ooh, that's interesting. I mean, certainly there. Are, I mean, there are my favorite actors, but the careers that I would love to have. Yeah. Um, oh, what what's her surname? Patricia. She was in um, uh, the Untouchables and like Easy A, and um, oh, she's in Lars and the Real Girl. She just she does this amazing thing where she navigates like she only takes the scripts that she wants, but right. she constantly flits between like super poppy like mainstream movies and then she'll do something super indie on the side that no one's heard about and like she'll get an Oscar nomination one year and then you won't hear from her for six more years and then right. it's, she just does this amazing thing. I don't know how she manages You like the idea that. of having that freedom to go, do what you want and, yeah. and do experimental stuff or do popular stuff yeah. and be pigeonholed. Exactly. Are there performances that inspire you? Are there specific uh, things you've seen on TV or in film? You're oh, like, oh, I wish I could get that part. I would love to do that. Oh, man. I don't know whether there's ones where I wish I could get that part. Oh, maybe. Now I'm just thinking about, oh, I just realized that um, there is a rumor. Okay. This yeah. is very important to me. There is a rumor that in the upcoming Power Rangers movies, they might cast Tommy, the white Power Ranger, right. as a girl. Okay. Which is thrilling because <laughs> Tommy was my favorite in the world as a child. I always, I always loved that leader character, and they were always named Tommy. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I didn't realize until fairly recently. I think I was flipping through the um, the Star Wars concept art books right. um, that I got in an op shop for like six dollars. Amazing. Nice. Um, but I found out that Luke was maybe going to be a girl originally. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah, and. I, I didn't realize until that moment that I had missed out on having, like, female role models that I connected sure. with. Sure. As soon as you start thinking about how things would be different if Luke were a girl, it would be colossal, right, in our culture. It would be and huge. And then that, that throws into relief this – suddenly now you're aware of how rare that has been. Exactly. The and then if, if they cast Tommy as a girl, suddenly my brain is going – Wait, but if I'd just run my life differently, if I just timed things differently, imagine if I could have been in the running for that. Well, like, I mean, oh. you never know. If you were in L.A., who knows? Yeah, yeah. When, at what point in your life did you realize that you were a, a nerd? I mean, I come from a nerd family. Really? Okay, so, so talk about that. Like what, I, I almost did that thing I hate where I said talk about that. So, talk, <laughs> who, so what makes your parents nerds? When did you realize my parents are nerds? I don't know. It took me a long time. I feel like I'm I'm a little bit of a, I mean, it's not a real thing, but like a jock nerd. Like uh, oh. <laughs> I've always been very social, right. very extroverted. So I've like gotten along with whoever. Sure. But I also like got a Spider-Man costume for my fourth birthday and wore it everywhere. And I saw the first X-Men movie when I was eight years old and I loved it and like fell into the superhero stuff. And then my mum and dad, like 
they they made a point of taking us to see the Star Wars movies when they were re-released okay. just before the prequels came out. Right. So they remastered them, but they hadn't changed anything about them yet, really. And so that was very, very cool. But I was definitely too young. Like oh. I fell asleep through the first two movies, but right. they were it was very important to dad and mom that I go and I see Star Wars at the cinema. And all sure. of my siblings, we all piled in and we we went and we saw it. Yeah. Now, was that because it's that your parents were movie nuts or was that because they were legit nerds? They're, they're Did that nerddom legit. manifest in any other way? Well, okay. Because mom, fantasy nerd, Oh, okay. All the way, she just she did her um, doctoral thesis on fantasy. Nice. Um, she did. Your mom has a PhD. <laughs> yeah, doctor, doctor, mom. That's doctor awesome. of doctor of fantasy, mom. That's awesome. Um, and it was it was like gender in uh, fantasy novels and medievalism nice. and that sort of a thing. So very very cool. She's always been into that. Um, apparently she was given D and D for for like her sixteenth birthday, but she never played it because it was a lot of numbers. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> which. I mean, understand. I'm just always impressed by anybody who can get a PhD. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I am quasi friends, as much as you'd be friends with somebody you haven't met, with uh, Dr. Jackson Crawford. And every time I talk to him, I call him Dr. Crawford. And he's like, you don't have to call me. I'm like, if I if I had a PhD, you would have to call me. I would demand it. <laughs> right. I would demand it. <laughs> so, and, so was there an awareness that being a nerd in any way made you different than other people, that you were interested in sort of non-mainstream stuff? Or for you, was it just you're interested in some mainstream stuff, you're interested in some nerd stuff, and it's all one? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was pretty breezy. Um, my my brother and my older sisters are maybe a little bit more classically nerdy. Got it. Uh, a little bit more introverted. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I suppose in schools in Australia, you don't have as stark a divide between groups. And then I also went to a performing arts high school. So right. then it was like everyone's a bit of a nerd. Sure, it's all, yeah. The dancers yeah. are jocks, I guess. But apart from that, everyone's kind of a dweeb. Uh, you're, either, you're either a band dweeb or you're a theater geek. So you did get... your mom being a, a fantasy a scholar, effectively, did that affect the stuff that you read? And did you were you steeped in stuff like, Lord, did you read or were you exposed to any obscure fantasy stuff? Well, I mean, yes, but I mean, she didn't start, she didn't go back to university until I was mid primary school, late primary school. She she did that out of spite as well. Someone on the internet on a Jane Austen forum said that she, she wasn't right because she didn't have the qualifications. And so mom said, screw you, I'll go and get them. And now she's that's the amazing. doctor. Um, so there's a did she theme. go back years later to that forum and go like, by the way, <laughs> yeah. I now have a PhD. Stick it, stick it in her signature on yeah. the forum, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got a theme running there. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. So I was like weaned on like C.S. Lewis and um, in Australia, at the very least, we have uh, Del Toro Quest. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's very kiddie, but it's just this series of fantasy novels where someone has like a belt and they have to go and collect magic gems to protect the kingdom and everything. So there was a lot of that. And I read a lot when I was younger. I actually don't read as much really? now, which is a shame. What happened? Um, I don't know. I, I really struggle to like focus on it. So I like reading. But if I'm going to read, I have to like shut myself in a room for a full sure. day and read the book. So it's it's harder to like relax while doing it. So I transition to like video games for the most part. Sure. Because well, I think it gets harder with the the prevalence of technology. Yeah. It's really easy instead of falling asleep with a book to be checking the internet yeah. or be on Twitter or. That's true. Plus, then in high school there was always fan fiction, which <laughs> was that a big part of your life? Yeah. Really? Well, strangely, I I kind of got into um, first online uh, play-by-post forum oh, sure. RPGs. Yep. I was big into Harry Potter and X-Men forum RPGs, uh, which was a lot of writing and a lot of reading. Not necessarily great quality, but it was a lot I of mean, words. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And then that flowed into fan fiction and just finding like the coolest, longest X-Men fan fictions that you could find and reading through them, which, yeah, that's probably the geekiest thing. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty nerdy. Uh, so you and your sister wrote Wolfgang. Yes. How much of how much of the production of Wolfgang, how much do you th think of yourself as a writer as opposed to an actor? Or do you have those divisions, those labels in your head? I mean, I, I think of myself as a writer much less now. Okay. And I think it's because I like dialogue. I like writing sure. dialogue. I find that really fun and pretty like breezy for me. But... I'm dreadful when it comes to like 
well, not exposition, because hopefully I wouldn't be expositing, but, um, you know, descriptions and like making sure that everything is is like painting a picture. I'm I'm just awful. I'm working on it. I'm slowly getting back into writing. But um, yeah, no, at a certain point I did sort of start thinking, Shannon's the writer, I'm, I'm the actor, yeah. So you're, so the fan fiction period of your life, yeah. when was that? How old were you? Oh, it's ongoing. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, it fades in and out depending on how busy I am or whatever. But yeah, it probably started around like ninth grade. Were you writing or reading or both? I I wrote when I was younger. Right, okay. Yeah. You wrote fan fiction when you were younger, but now yeah. it's mostly... or, or I wrote and published when I was younger. Every now and then I still dabble in fan fiction, but I, I, I don't tend to post much. <laughs> when did Dungeons & Dragons enter your life? Super late. Really? Super late. My brother was into RPGs, tabletop RPGs, um, but he tended to play sort of... he. What is it? What is it called? Rogue Trader, the oh, yeah, Warhammer. Sure. Yep. Yeah, and so he would tell me about what happened in his games, and that was always fun. Um, and I sort of very slowly transitioned into Pathfinder stuff and like looking into it. But I didn't really start playing D anD D until my second or third year of university. You had done play by post stuff online in uh, other established universes. Yeah. When you started playing D and D at a table with dice, was it different than you expected, or did you pretty much know what was going to happen? And I feel like I kind of got it. I feel like I kind of knew where it was going when I started. Do you remember your first game? The oh, first actually, it, again, it wasn't. It was Rogue Trader. My brother was going to run his first game. Right. Oh no. Okay. So now I'm getting you memories. Into- um, and he he was like, I I want to practice just making sure that I can actually like describe things and and if you could come and like have a practice session that'd be great. And so we sat down and we tried, but it didn't occur to me that I could say things like I go to the library and that would be fine. I was like, I don't know where the library is. I've got to find the library. And I didn't like think I could ask any people because sure. I didn't grasp that he would make up an NPC. Yeah, you didn't know what so you So I was do. like, I don't know, I climbed the building you described to see the thing and I got arrested. He got so fed up with me within 10 minutes <laughs> that he just stopped. He was like, it's fine, it's fine. Don't even worry about it, I'll work it out. And what was your what was your experience there? Were you like, well, that was a waste of time. Or you were like, actually, I was enjoying that. I, I want, or what was, did, it, did you see that it was gonna lead anywhere? I didn't see that it was gonna lead. I was having a good time mm-hmm. just cause it's fun hanging out with your brother. But um, yeah, no, I, I was very confused mostly. I was just like, but what did I do wrong? Tell I me. don't understand. And how long after that did you end up in a Pathfinder game? Oh, a long time. Right. A long time, yeah. And what was your experience there? Were you like, yeah, this is cool? Or were you like, uh? Yeah, it was really cool. It was, um, uh, my friend Eric was running a game um, at university with a couple of his friends. It was okay. very, it was very um, different to my roots in forum play because yep. <laughs> they were engineering and science students who were all there to min-max yep. and to do the most damage. And I was there like, ah, I'm going to do this deliberately not good thing because I think that that's what I would do. And but Were you aware at the time that there was pr- maybe a different way to play that would be less uh, science and engineering nerds and more maybe theater and yeah, literature I'd, nerds? Yeah, I'd heard talk. I'd heard tell. <laughs> so were you aware like like there maybe there's a better group for me or maybe there's another way to play yeah or did you or were you this is the experience i guess i must well i i ended up leaving that group uh only like six sessions in or something because uni got busy and everything was tricky so i it it, i basically didn't play again until i was running a game because and yeah okay so that's the next question is when did you start dming when did you get behind the screen yeah it was like a year after that so that was probably third year university, something like so that. So you played Rogue Trader with your brother. Yeah. And my, it, my, my, my interpretation of what you said is, played Rogue Trader with your brother, years go by, yeah. you jump into a Pathfinder game with a bunch of science nerds, yeah. and then you're like, screw it, I'm just gonna run a game myself. Yeah. Did it feel like <laughs> destined, like I'm just, this is where I was, I'm gonna end up doing this anyway. <laughs> I mean, kind of, because it was, I knew that I had friends in my theater degree who wanted to play. We uh, talked about it before. We yeah. were like, this looks like fun. We should do this thing. But yeah, it, it was. It became very clear to me that no one was going to run the game. It was gonna have to be you. So I had to do it. So, but was, was that it or was there a desire to run? Was there a desire to be the person behind the screen or was there a desire to play and 
No one else is going to do it. I mean, I think there was definitely some desire to run it as well because I'm a little bit of a control freak sometimes. And it's, it's good to be the one who gets to make the call. Do you get frustrated playing in other DMs games? Um, not really. I've finally actually got a game that I'm playing in rather than running. Right. And it's it's kind of nice. It's it's chill. As long as I can sit back and just go, well. What what would you say is the primary draw of being the dungeon master? What is it what is your in? Is it world building? Is it uh, making playing NPCs? Is it the, the plot, the adventure? I don't know. It might be the world building. I I just feel like I've said before that I think the curse of the dungeon master is that the only way to play the game that you want to play in is to run it yourself. Sure. Because every DM is going to run it differently. So if I want to play this particular level of like grit to fantasy to whatever, then that's what I'm going to have to do. And I'm going to have to build that myself and make sure that it happens. If you were going to choose, if you had the opportunity, uh, Genie shows up and says, I'm going to grant you this wish. You can play D&D from now on or the system of your choice. It doesn't have to be D&D, but you never, you're going to have a great DM, but you're never going to get to run again. Or, oh. or you get to, you're going to have amazing players, but you're going to be a DM and you're never going to run again. Which would it be? Oh, gee, that's a bad genie. Well, Genies I mean, are this meant is to the give genie you, you three got. open-ended wishes. Yeah, unfortunately, this is the, this is the genie you got. It's the cut, it's the cut okay. rate. Oh, it's the Gary no. Gygax genie. Can never run again. Can never play. Both, again. If, the, if you're, if you're the DM, they're going to be amazing players. If you're a player, it's going to be a great DM. But you're going to be stuck with one or the other. I don't think I could stop tinkering with things. I think I'd have to DM. Right. You have to get behind the screen. I think I'd have to, yeah. And do you find that there is any part of being a dungeon master that factors into writing and acting? Do you feel like there's a feedback loop that happens? Yeah, but I mean, I I feel like that happens with any kind of art. Like, no matter what it is, it just feeds into everything as you go through. Do you think about campaigns that you want to run? Do you have other systems that you'd want to play? I do <laughs> that, that was the weirdest tone of voice that I could have picked possibly. <laughs> well, I mean, it seems like there is probably uh, a story there. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing at the moment, I keep, it's it's so stupid, but I, I keep uh, sort of looking at the systems that are available for, maybe it's going back to my roots again, for like um, pre-existing franchises or whatever. Right. So like look for a Buffy game or whatever. Sure. Or like, and yeah. then being frustrated that it doesn't like feel like Buffy. And so I write my own set of rules to feel like Buffy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm trying to, like, tie up loose ends with those things and then make my friends play those so that I can see what's wrong with them and then keep going. And how, how close are you to doing that? Like, when are, we, when, when are you going to run your Buffy game? I mean, hopefully sooner rather than later. Right. I'm, I'm at the phase where I'm having to actually write everything out so that it's – Something so people could read, read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is just head. the worst part. <laughs> very ah, tedious. <laughs> ah, now I think I sense uh, the providence of a tweet. You tweeted at me when you uh-huh. were like, how do you organize information so that people that can read it? That is exactly it. <laughs> now, now I get it because you're in that point of this is terrible. I can't just. It's like I know all the things, but yeah. I, the That's person no reading them doesn't. Yep. That's, I'm just, not going to be there to help You can't help just them. say, trust me, I know what I'm, I know what I'm exactly. doing. Exactly. And then, and then run the game. Are you happy with uh, D&D as a, as a game? Is there, do you seek out other, are there other systems that attract you that you like, oh, I like this mechanic or. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of stuff that I'm interested in. I really love the character creation stuff from like Kids on Bikes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and a lot of games that are coming out now. Um, D&D though, like like fifth edition at the very least, I'm so impressed with the simplicity that it's taken. Yeah. Like coming from Pathfinder, especially oh, sure. where it's all right. floating modifiers. Yep. And I was already like simplifying them to run the game because I was like, I described I, it as a I game where if you miss, just spend five minutes thinking and you'll be able to come up with another bonus you forgot about. And yeah. Get. Um, and so Coming in with like, I mean, sure, stuff like um, like advantage disadvantages. Yep. Just Very simple, straightforward. A huge yep. change to everything. But I feel like, I mean, the thing that I love the most that that feels the most elegant is having sort of gotten rid of negative numbers for the most part. Right. There aren't penalties. That's, they're just bonuses. Exactly. It's like yeah. if you're normal, you're just normal. But if you've trained, then you get to be good at it. You know yeah. that I I can see the ripple effect that it's having across game design and that's the stuff that i'm really excited for so i mean i'm always going to nitpick i'm always going to look at things and go why did you do this with the beastmaster ranger <laughs> but 
Yeah, it seems like a lot of people have that reaction to something, but that's the the game is so complex. Yeah, There's exactly. No way. And it's never going to please everyone either. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they and knowing that I think frees you as a designer. Yeah. Because now you can just make it the game that you wish it was. Do you ever think about uh, doing your own fan like if you're going to make your own Buffy game? Have you thought about doing your own fantasy game and saying I'm just going to start from scratch? I don't know what I would build do a for game. my own fantasy game. Really? Cuz I feel like fantasy games at the very least they've got that medievalist. Sure sort of bent I mean they wouldn't have to I guess but um, a majority do and so you've got you've got that stuff in place of like armor weaponry that's pre-guns pre you know gunpowder all that stuff and I feel like games have worked out how to pretty adequately simulate that and yeah I feel like the the areas where I get most caught up is trying to work out, okay, but then if you're making Buffy, if you're making a modern setting, if you're making whatever, you're not wearing armor. So what right. do you do instead of having an armor class? What do you do instead of, you know? Do you spend time thinking about how to mo- how to mechanically model the structure of the show? Yeah. <laughs> and is that, is that, do you, how do you, how close do you feel like you get to? I feel like I'm getting there. It's much more abstract right. i think there's less dice stuff and i mean at the moment it's it's so overcomplicated but it's also well give me give me give, pitch me oh uh, no if, if oh. you don't mind <laughs> i'll put you on the spot pitch me like is there a core die mechanic is there tell me just one detail you don't have to okay so i liked uh, i like that idea that you see in a lot of modern uh setting rpgs that are coming out at the moment where you have a different die for each skill depending on how good you are right okay except that then you end up with just really bizarre ranges of roles and stuff. So I've I've got basically for each skill you can have a different level of die. Okay. But um, it's got an anchor with a D twelve. Ah, so it's always a D twelve plus some other modifier. Yeah. I get it. So which is a not a great system. It's very complicated. But you get to use all your dice. <laughs> I think the D twelve is a sadly underused die. It I is. Wish, it's I a wish, pretty die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is this the first time we've ever done this? I can't tell. Uh, it seems, <laughs> seems like we're complete professionals. Uh, uh, why are people texting me while I'm doing an interview? Uh, they ahem. Know. Uh, yeah, I love. I think like uh, Savage Worlds. I think has that uh, step die thing. I think Greg Gordon was a great designer. There was a DC Heroes game he did that had like stepped dice. So I always thought was neat. Any uh, people like rolling the polyhedrals. Like people who know nothing, they sit down at the table for the first time, and they're like, ooh, these are neat. And right there, they like rolling those dice, so yeah. don't, And don't... it's always so sad to me that like you make a character and you've made your your rogue or whatever, Yeah. but then you're limited to, you've got your d20 that you roll all the time, Yep. you've got your d4s, for yep. your dagger probably, and then you've got a d6 a if you're doing your sneak it. attack, and that's it, you you're never, never use gonna the see other a d12. dice. You're it's never, just, yeah. it's so sad. Completely agree. Oh man, and I actually, maybe, you, Again, was out of spite. I, the, <laughs> in in the system I'm working on, the D20 basically doesn't Hardly get used. used. I I think I have it as basically a spin down life. Oh, okay, like measure. a life tracker yeah. or something like that. Yeah, that, I get that. Uh, where do you suck at D20? Do you? I mean, it's it's doing okay. I think the D20 is popular enough that it can stand to be, you know, sidelined <laughs> in some games. Uh, what? Where does the interest in mythology come from. A substantive percentage of a YouTube channel is myth and mythology and a combination, like you come at it from a couple different angles. You not only do direct to camera, I'm going to tell you the story, but you also like act out stories for your, your, it seems like your mom, for your relatives and, and you film that. And so it seems like myth is a huge part of your life. Is it a hobby? Is it something that you ever thought about making a living out of? You took a, you have a literature degree. I assume that there's some overlap there. I, I do I do have a literature. So where does that where does the mythology interest come from? I, I honestly can't quite remember. I think it might have been the age of mythology computer games. Okay. Which again, I, I'm, my youngest sister is showing right now because again, my brother would be playing right. and I'd be hanging around be in the background watching him play. He also would stop and read every sort of index entry. Okay. Did he read it so, out loud? No, he okay. did not. Oh, I so see. I just had to sit there. Yeah, I don't think I hostage. intended to like, read it. I wanted him to keep playing, but he had it open, so it was all that was there. So yeah, I read it. Well read it. And then he would turn it off before I could finish and whatever. But um, and I can remember when I was relatively young. Mum claims she didn't, but I can remember her telling me some stories from Greek mythology. Really? She says that that doesn't make sense, but I remember her telling me the story of Narcissus becoming the daffodil. Right. How does that turn into? It, there, it seems like there's a huge gulf yeah. between playing 
uh, Age of Mythology, or it was Age of Empires. What was the? It, it was Age of Mythology. Age of but Mythology. It was part of the Age of Empires. Okay, that makes sense. How do we get from there to your what seems to me to be you have a really deep and uh, broad understanding of myth? I I don't know, and it was it was so crazy because um, <coughs> what is uh, there's uh, yes. a frog in it's, my throat. It's all the smog we have here now in now. That's what it That's is. A problem. Yeah. Well, I should never have come here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, when I started my YouTube channel, I was looking into right. doing it and I saw um, sort of an announcement on the Geek and Sundry main yep. channel that said, we're, we're looking vloggers. for vloggers. Yep. Do you have a special interest? You can make a vlog. And I was like, well, the timing's right. I may as well try. And I was trying to think of what my geeky subject was. I right. didn't know what it was. And then I caught myself, I was talking to a friend over lunch at uni and I just was like, and that reminds me of the story of Sisyphus. And, you know, it's so bizarre that blah, blah, blah. And I, I told this whole thing and I knew all these bizarre details about like Aeolus stealing the cows and whatever. And afterwards she, she kept going, mm -hmm, yep, great, yep, <laughs> all right, okay. And then afterwards I went, oh, wait, yeah, I guess this I is it. <laughs> So was there, if there hadn't been the Geek and Sundry, so Geek and Sundry was looking for content, they were looking for people, and because it's their videos, you could live anywhere, you don't have to be in LA, and they found you, and you produced a bunch of uh, Greek mythology, specifically I think Greek mythology yeah. videos for them uh, from your home, and w w would that have happened on its own without Geek and Sundry? Would you have ended up on YouTube without that impetus? I don't know, because I wouldn't have been doing the Greek mythology videos. I think having that one thing and then also having a, a contract that made me come out with a new it. video every yeah. two weeks. But um, yeah, I definitely had like the the impetus to make YouTube videos, but I don't know if it would have lasted. I don't know oh, if really? I would have had an idea of what to make. I don't know if I would have. Ah, so them coming along and saying, you, you're the one who will be doing this content. Yeah. Now you're on the hook and you got to do it. Yeah. And so that kind of. And I did that for like two years. Wow. Okay. And that got me in the habit. Yeah. <laughs> so that was good. And so how, let's, so now we can talk, we can transition into talking. Well, no, hang on. I'm still curious about mythology because I still feel as though there's a gulf between I played Age of Mythology and now I can sit here at university at the cafeteria and talk for half an hour about uh, There's Sisyphus. a gulf in my memory. Like, how do we get from one to the other? There must have been books you read. I, I did. I know that. Um, <laughs> I, I know. read them. I don't remember them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know that at least once I got a book award for doing well academically in primary school. We got to like take a trip to the bookstore. Yeah. And you could, you had like a budget. Oh, wow. You okay. Pick whatever cool. book you wanted within that budget. And I found a, a shiny, like, gold and blue mythology book. And, oh, it was technically mythical creatures. I think that's okay. what I tended to look into was books of mythical creatures, like bestia bestiaries and whatever. But, um, yeah, I think just slowly over time, bits of it got stuck in my brain. Oh, okay. So it was just something you were accumulating slowly over time. Yeah. There wasn't a deep dive into like Bullfinch's mythology. Or yeah. Anything. I don't remember any moments where I was like, I love this and I oh, need okay. to know more about it. I just one day was suddenly aware of how much I knew. How much knowledge you had accumulated. Yeah. And now it's on YouTube. Now yeah. Created... And I mean, I still do the research before every video. So right. now I just get more and more details and I'm like, oh, suddenly I know who wrote this version of the oh, story. Nice. And suddenly I know different versions. And Is it mostly for you the Greek stories? Because I know you also know a lot about the Egyptian mythology. Well, uh, a lot is strong. Well, more <laughs> me probably. I know bits. <laughs> uh, where, what is it about the Greek myths in particular that you find I don't know. attractive? I, I think it's, I mean, because like I said, I, I was growing up on like C.S. Lewis and stuff. Right. You've got this, this thing where Greek mythology was just carried through. Sure. Because it gets carried through into the Roman, the Romans carry it through to yeah. England and then it gets into the Shakespeare and then it gets into that. And it's just like this classical canon that's kind of embedded in everything. Sure. And so then just just hearing like references to things and being like, oh, I wonder what that is, or I know what that is. Or, so it's purely, it sounds like it's purely uh, uh, idiosyncratic. Like where your interest in mythology has led you hasn't been systematic. Yeah, you never thought about like, I'm going to go spend a, a month reading about the Norse myths. Or yeah, well, I mean, there are ones that grab me. So like I'm a big fan of the prose edda personally. Okay. Over the poetic edda, you know, people can come at me, but that's my preference. Um, or like, um, oh, what is it? What is it called? I should know the name and I'm doing a bad job of 
remembering right now, but um, the Icelandic yeah. mythological cycle. Yeah, the Finn, the not the not the Finn bar. No, I can't remember. Oh, it was one of the things. It's on that... the tip of my tongue. But um, yeah, I got a copy of that for Christmas last year, and I was so excited to read it as well because I mean, it's just got a fascinating like poetic structure to it, sure. which yeah. No, there's there's lots of bits that grab me, but Greek mythology is such an easy one. Like it's, well, it's, like you said, it's part of the Western canon, so it's yeah. kind of always in the background. And the way that we tell stories is based so heavily on the way no, that I, stories were told. Like yeah. it, it just kind of carries through, and it's such that oral tradition. Yeah, exactly. So you're a YouTuber for Geek and Sundry, and then eventually you're a YouTuber for you. Yeah. How uh, that that transition was that abrupt? Was it something? Was there a point where you're like, I just want to make YouTube videos. I don't want to have to be no, beholden to someone else or. <laughs> it was definitely abrupt, right? And uh, it, it was not a decision that we necessarily made I get it. Uh, on the on the vlogger side of things. But um, yeah, no, it was well. Nothing lasts forever. But yeah. When it, end, when it ended, were you like, I want to keep doing this? Yeah, I mean, I had a little patch that I guess it was delayed because I was making videos with them for for just under two years, and then there was about a year where I just kept doing it on my own because right. that was the cycle. That's what I was used to, and then. 2016 around about, I just kind of stopped making videos for the okay. most part and had this this whole year where I was like, do I want to do this? Is this actually like I'm getting real tired of editing because it's the worst thing in the world. Um, <laughs> but I know how you feel. It's just, it's just a nightmare. It's great to have, having done it. Yeah. It's great. It's done. I finished it, but the actual doing of it's it. It's like is. I, I have a skill. I like filming and then I like having it finished. Sure. But that whole patch in the middle is just awful. So, um, yeah, there was just this this long patch of time where I wasn't sure whether I was going to do it. And at the time, I also had like stalkers or whatever coming oh. and, and sending me tons of information. So it was just like, it was a lot to be dealing with. So I wasn't sure whether I was going to do it. But then towards the end of that year, I sort of stopped and I went, no, I, I like it. I like making videos and I like talking to people online and I like, you know. Do you have an idea of about how long it takes you to make a video? Like when you're talking to camera, you record for this long and then yeah. you edit it down. How long do you go on average? Just filming and then editing it down. I probably record like 50 minutes, okay. 40 minutes maybe. And then that gets cut down to around about 17 minutes. Right. I used to be hopeful. I was like, maybe this one will be 12 minutes, but it's always 17, it, no matter what I do. Are shorter videos better? They used to be. What does that mean? Are they not anymore? They used to do well. Right. <laughs> But uh, also, I've never really been able to do short videos. I tried it during the auditions for Geek and Sundry Vlogs. They, they were like, you have to keep this under four minutes. And <laughs> it was a struggle. Yeah, that's a super, that's, yeah. you're not going to, well, I mean, I think you can do a lot of personal stuff in four minutes. But if you're trying to break down a whole subject in four yeah. minutes, that and, seems kind of crazy. And I'm telling these stories. I'm like, there's a lot of names I have to cover. I don't know. But once I got through into the second round, I got special permission to make a longer video. Nice. And I think my second one was like eight minutes. <gasps> eight minutes. Eight Twice, minutes. it's 100% Longer. Yeah, and they so, just grew over time. Now, when you make a video, do you have a notion of whether or not, uh, like, are longer videos, do you think, better for your audience? Or are you trying to always keep them as as succinct as possible? I try to keep them as succinct as possible for the sake of my sanity. Fair enough. For editing. Right. But uh, I do think that the people who watch my videos tend to, like, longer, but not too long. 17 minutes is a good sweet spot. It's not bad. How, how much time do you spend looking at your metrics? I don't look at them as much as I used to. Really? Yeah, and I, I just wonder whether it's because YouTube changed what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> I they changed the UI, and now it's like, yeah. oh, fine. Now Screw. I have to, like, retrain where I'm looking. Yeah. They moved where the subscribers are. I yep. don't know. It's all very they, – they pride different things now. But, um, yeah, and I think past a certain point – Maybe it, maybe it was during that year where I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do it anymore. Right. Maybe it was during that that I sort of was like, the number doesn't mean as much to me as like people commenting and sure. having conversations or like. Engagement. Engagement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then sheer numbers. Yeah. And do you, are there things you want to do on YouTube that you haven't done yet? Are there subjects you want to cover outside of like D&D &D or mythology? Are there things that you want to, you think this make a great video and you, and you think I could do it? Yeah, I mean, bits and pieces. I, I often have, like, ideas that I'm really taken with for, like, a month. And then after that, I'm like, would that actually work? I I had an idea for a series. It might still happen. Who knows? Um, but I'm really bad at sport. Okay. But have a lot of sporty relatives. Got it. And in particular, I 
I'm known in my family for a rant I had about the rules of tennis because that sport doesn't make sense. It, quite frankly, I know that people can understand it. Sure. That doesn't mean that it makes sense. Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. have explained it to me and it doesn't make it make more sense. I think any game where you have to say, imagine a clock, <laughs> if you're explaining the score and you have to say, imagine a clock, there's a problem. Uh, but my granddad is a big tennis player. He's played for much of his life and continues to do so, even though he's in his 70s, 80s. Um, and so I had an idea to make a video with my granddad where I explain the rules to tennis the best I can. <laughs> and then I play the sport with my granddad. And then I was like, I could make a whole series of this. I have, I have cousins who play soccer. I'll explain the rules to soccer and then I'll play the thing. And, uh, and sort of got halfway through that and then realized, I don't know how I'm going to film this. I don't know. I don't so you know. actually did some work on it. You yeah. actually like a, a lot of planning went into it, but then I was like, I don't have like GoPros. I don't have mics that I could run around with. Yep. I don't have, I don't know how I would do it. I still might do the tennis one because I think that'll be a lot of fun. But. Well, and then see if people like it. And if so, then that tells exactly. you it's worth yeah. uh, investing in. Do you think of yourself as a and d YouTuber or as a mythology YouTuber? Or does that, does that kind of identity factor into your thought process at all? Um, a, a bit. I try not to. Okay. Because I'm worried about sticking too close to one thing. And sure, because then that's the only thing you can do. Exactly. Right. It's like actually a little while after you first shouted out my video yes. and I had so many D&D people coming in. Like now you're like, uh-oh, these people I are deliberately, be disappointed. I because... very deliberately made a video yeah. that was analyzing poetry. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. Because yeah. I That was wanted... very inspiring to me. It made me want to do that. I'm glad because I was like, this is something I like and that I'm interested in. And I kind of was already planning on doing that. But then I had a thought of like, I'm going to have to make more D&D videos because people are here for it. And then I thought, no, no, no. I need to make sure that they know right now that I will make videos that aren't D&D and yeah. I will make videos that aren't mythology. And sometimes I'll just do a thing that I like. Like analyze a poem. Yeah. What, what was the poem? Uh, what was the poem? It was probably Hopkins. It was probably Pitch Past Pitch of Grief. Okay. I'm trying to remember because I watched that video. I'm trying to see what that was about. <laughs> what? do the people in your life think about your YouTube career? Like what do your parents think about the fact that you are on YouTube and people watch you? My parents love it. They're super supportive. My grandma and granddad, super supportive. Uh, I think for the most part, everyone's like supportive and happy with it. Right. There was definitely a patch there where people were like, oh, okay, this is what you're spending your time on. <laughs> like, where's your day job? What are you actually going to make money with? Right. Um, but now that I'm, you know, now that I'm in the, the, the 50,000 plus team, right. suddenly. And you're like, hey, I've got over 50,000. It's 000. real. Like it's if for people matter. outside of YouTube, if you say, I've got 50,000 subscribers, they're like, holy crap. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like that's, 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 that's more a than lot. I thought you were going to say. Yeah, that's on YouTube. I don't know if people know this, but YouTube, I think they still do this. Mm. They do this great thing when you're starting out where they're like, hey, you've got 10,000 subscribers now. Just so you know, that would fill this local sports stadium yeah. or whatever. And you're like, what? And you get these, you would now be able to sell out this one place. I only got one of those and oh, it was really? at a hundred and it was, you huh. can fill a movie theater. <laughs> and I was like, that's great. And I was very excited. That's still a lot. But ever since I'm like, where are my, where are my other messages? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I think they may have stopped doing uh, it, which is too bad because I thought it was really neat when I would get those messages. I was recently watching, um, my sister was watching a, a Japanese band concert live DVD and she was talking about it and she said, and this stadium is like the, the big one. It's got 50,000. And I went, Raywin, that's how many people subscribe to me. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's really weird being able to actually imagine it. Do you ever feel this pressure to make more content and, and chase those subscriber numbers and engagement, or do you still feel free to make whatever video you want, whatever you want to make? I definitely feel it, but I try to fight it, <laughs> try to deliberately ignore it and just do what I want to do anyway. It's, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Cause in, in what sense is it? Is it you don't is it part of your you don't want it to become too much a part of your identity or define you? It's it's the balance of how much of it is my channel and how much of it is the audience's channel. Oh, interesting. It's that thing of like, yeah, they subscribed because I made this kind of content. So yeah. I should definitely be giving them more of that. Otherwise it's it feels misleading. But not wanting to get stuck and stop having fun. It's the difference between working for them or working for yourself. Yeah. Do you ever think about being a professional YouTuber and just saying, This is what we're gonna do? For a living. I've thought about it. 
Right. And do you is there a path there, do you think? Because it seems like your content is definitely popular enough. Yeah, so that, like, right now, do you monetize? Do you see revenue from YouTube? And is does it make a dip? Does that, does that money mo motivate you? Do you think to yourself, this number would be bigger if I made more videos? Uh, the money doesn't motivate me. It's okay. nice to see, but it's because I started so long ago making pittance because right. we monetized under Geek and Sundry. Um, we, it, it's just something that I sit in the back of my head going, oh, well, that's, you know, that's pocket money. That's fine. Sure. So the number's gotten bigger and then I go, oh, no, I have too much pocket money, um, <laughs> which is alarming. Um, I didn't I'm, know you could I'm, have too much pocket money. I'm used to just having, like, my first paycheck from Google was $50. Oh, yeah. It was very exciting. It came as a physical check. And I yeah. went to cash it. And they said, this will cost you more to, to cash this check that is in US dollars. Oh, wow. <laughs> then you will get from Holy it. Holy moly. And I had to, yeah, go back so and like, Well, I guess I'm just going to frame it or something. Yeah. So um, it's definitely grown <laughs> since right. then. Um, but I mean, even then, most of the money that I make is coming through Patreon. It's okay, sure. totally different. Uh to the to the advertising stuff um yeah so is it something that you think is going to be a part of your life you know indefinitely is that is that in your mind do you think about that or do you think oh this is just a, a hobby i have right now and like any other hobby it could stop i mean i absolutely think about it and i would love for it to continue going but i'm also i've got that thing in the back of my head that's like but you're a girl and like how long can you last as a girl, like my thing right now is like, I'm, I'm a young, hip chick DM or whatever, right? Yeah. Like the, I've, I've got a certain gimmick going on. Sure. Yeah. Just I by... mean, but I think, I mean, this is obviously, I have the privilege of being able to say this. I think that your gimmick is direct to camera authenticity experience and that the stuff you're saying, because there are, there are lots of YouTubers I follow who are like Franz Lab, who are you know, obviously not making any kind of concession to the fact that they're a woman on YouTube and they have successful channels. Yeah. I think that's the brilliance of YouTube is that it doesn't have to be, it can be, but it doesn't have to be that toxic internet thing where if you're a, if you're a girl, you're doomed. It does seem as though yeah. things are getting better and there's more of a democratization of... And certainly to a degree, this is just like my quarter life crisis speaking, like <laughs> you're aging. That doesn't go <laughs> Very away. Very soon you're going to be super old. And that doesn't go away. That, that, that's... Everything you love will go away. But I think what YouTube demonstrates is that there is, that you can go directly to an audience and not have to worry about a casting director choosing you or, you know, you can, you, and, and that that will work. You have demonstrated that there is an audience for Dale Kingsmill content and does that give you any does that give you more relief or more stress because now there's an audience waiting for you um i think more relief yeah okay i've been really lucky when it comes to like the audience lottery right i've, I've had like really cool people kind of looking out for me the whole way and yeah do you know off the top of your head what your most popular video is my most popular one the one it, that got it, the most views oh it used to be the Australian accent tag. I think it still is. It is? I just Okay, yeah. okay, great. What were you gonna say though? You were gonna say, but now it might be. The, the, there's a, there are a couple of D&D ones that are creeping up there. Which one, which one is it? It's, it'll be, Thieves Can't I think is the most popular in terms of people come up to me and say, oh. the Thieves Can video That's awesome. was great. So do people recognize you? Like when you, when you go, like, have you had the experience of going out to eat, going to a mall or whatever. And I don't know if people still go to malls. And uh, and people going, oh, my God, you're Dale Kingsmill. I watch all your videos. Never when I'm just out and about. But oh. at conventions, people oh, sure. stop me and say, oh, hey. My favorite one was um, someone who just stopped me and said, hey, you're that chick who you made that video about D&D. &D. And I was like, yeah, that's me. All and those things like, just are true. That was great. And I think I liked it because he clearly didn't, like, know who I was. Sure, yeah. He, he wasn't, like, a... It didn't have this a, fan creator yeah. feeling to it. It just felt like two people being like, hey, I've yeah, seen this stuff. Yeah, he was and, like, hey, I recognize you. And I was like, oh. Do you think, like, I need to run more D&D &D so that I can have more ideas for more videos? Is yeah. that part of the process? Or do you feel like, well, whatever comes up, well, that'll, that'll be what I make a video about? Yeah. I mean, my process is definitely much more like, oh. Oh no, it's already been a week. Time to time to make another video. So you're conscious what do I of got? the fact that time is passing and <laughs> What do I have? Where are my notes? Have I come up with any new little things for D D yet? No, I'm not done with that. Okay, well what stories are there that I can tell? What's it? Do you have a list of ideas for videos? I did. And you, then you made all those videos. <laughs> yep. And they're like, well now what? And I didn't make another list and I should have. <laughs>
short questions before the end. Uh, what is your favorite 1957 movie starring Spencer Tracy and Audrey Hepburn? I'm going to say desk set. Uncertain Correct. of. Okay, great. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite Greek hero whose name begins with P? Uh, Perseus. Correct. Uh, Have you done research? What's happening? <laughs> well, I mean, look, this is, listen, we're professionals, eh? Uh, all right, so I don't, <laughs> so I don't want to stress you out. What, uh, there's not necessarily a right answer to this one. What is the most recent movie that you saw in a theater? Uh, Endgame. And what did you think of Endgame? I really liked it. I cried a lot. Really? I cried yeah, lots of places a to cry. lot. <laughs> yeah. Can you remember when? Cried at what? Oh, so many bits. Um, I cried opening scene. Wait, but spoilers though. Well, I mean, it's too late. This already passed the, there was an official. There was uh, an embargo yep. and now we're, okay. Um, Hawkeye's family yep. at the very yep. beginning. That felt like watching Logan again. That was just Yeah, like, sure. Yeah, that had that <gasps> same. I felt like the hard thing, The hard, when I saw that, I thought, Really, what they should do is just have two hours of what happens right after that. Because that story of what's happening to that guy just literally in the next two hours is more interesting, I thought, emo like emotionally and as far as character goes, than anything we're going to see. But yeah, it's hard. It's hard to pull that stuff it was It was a great way to start the movie. Yeah. It really was. Um, and then I cried at Nebula and Tony being friends on the spaceship. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, well, there's a moment where he says to her, like, okay, good job. You won. And they're, like, there's this sense, like, has anyone ever said that to her before? Ever. Right. Right? Oh my gosh, Nebula's whole storyline yeah. was pro probably my favorite thing throughout the movie. I really wanted her to get the kill on Thanos. Oh really? Well, it, yeah. I mean, I it feel makes like a lot she of sense. It. Yeah. But uh, but also the meta, like I I feel like a whole lot of the th the last third of the film right. was obviously speaking directly to the audience rather than caring so much about its internal story. Sure. So like having. Having Tony say, I am Iron Man and yep. kill Thanos, that was for the audience. That was yeah. that was for them who watched the first Iron Man movie and came yep. all the way through, rather than actually being a Rather than what's best for the story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think there's also, we see a lot of them, they have the luxury of knowing there's going to be more movies after this. Yeah. Where a lot of people making movies don't have that. Yeah. So they can have Captain Marvel have like two lines of dialogue and everyone's like, are you serious? And they're like, they know, don't worry. There's, it's fine. Captain Marvel is going to be a big deal in the next group of movies. We're trying to wrap up this stuff. And I think that's what we see a lot of yeah. is them being like, we know we're going to make more movies. So we can do more stuff with Nebula, for instance. But yeah, it would have been great to see Nebula be the one. That would have been a very different story. That would have been a very different beginning, middle, and end. Absolutely. But I think emotionally that would have been, you know, astonishing. Dale, thank you very much for coming out here and being sort of my first uh, – our first guinea pig. I'd love to do more of these. The next time you're out here, uh, I'll try to see if we can get you to do it again. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. You're a fantastic interview. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I encourage you to check out Dale's channel. She has some of the best D&D content on YouTube. And also, you're going to learn a lot about mythology, all of which I think is applicable to whatever you're doing as a creative person, whether you're a writer or a DM. And she has an entire web series of 40 episodes with her and her friends uh, pretending to be werewolves uh, in Australia. Australian werewolves is how she pitched it. Uh, so thanks for watching, everybody, and hopefully we'll do this again soon.